Hi, and welcome to this edition of A Conversation With. I'm Jim Marshall of the New Bedford Cable Network, and joining us in studio today, someone familiar with the studio for sure, but we got him in here for his official capacity too, Paul Chase. From, he was the uh, Chief Executive Officer for, I want to make sure I get it, the Realtors Association of Southeastern Massachusetts. Correct. Because I said to you off camera, I'm like, I'm always used to saying Great New Bedford Realtors Association. Right, right. right. A couple of years ago, about five years ago, we uh, merged with the uh, North Bristol Association, which is in Taunton, and uh, we kind of uh, became larger. And so now our membership, represent, we're represented from Bourne to about Providence, all the way up through Attleboro and Brockton. And what does that do for you, um, just the merger? So from an association standpoint, it allows us to have more resources for our, for our members, right? Education, better education, uh, more education. Uh, we've now inherited this building in Taunton that we do digital media production ourselves with. We have two different classrooms, which pre-COVID we were using all the time. Right. Uh, so different areas of the, uh, the, the uh, southeastern Massachusetts state. So, you know, it provides more resources for our, our agents, more networking opportunities. A lot of real estate has now become regional, so it also helps in that way. And we'll talk about that. We brought Paul in today because one of the things that we've heard, especially during the pandemic here in the last year, is the one thing that's remained hot uh, industry has been real estate. Yes. Um, I'm curious, does that surprise you? Uh, so I'll, t I'll say that it surprises me a little with the amount of buyers that are still out there uh, with the economic forecasts that we've had and you know with some of the downturn that there's been but there are a lot of buyers out there still looking to to purchase and that's been all throughout the uh, the pandemic you know back in March um, things were starting to heat up and uh, the pandemic hit and real estate, we weren't even sure if we were gonna be able to do business, right? Most of the business had shut down. Fortunately enough, uh, the governor deemed uh, our business uh, as an essential business, so they could continue to do that. Uh, we saw April and May uh, a little bit soft on the closings to be expected because it, even though we're essential business, we were trying to figure out how we were able, we could get people together even. So April and May and a little bit of June were a little soft, uh, but it was never, it was never a stop. It was right. never stopped. And then it just blew up from there. And it's funny because, you know, I had read even throughout the course of the year, it wasn't just this area. It, the whole state was just, and I guess even Rhode Island was seeing, an, a, not an explosion, but certainly a, an unbelievable amount of transactions and things going on. Massachusetts often leads the entire area in, um, in sales and in production. Uh, we find that when we do national we do national Zoom meetings right now, but uh, when we do national meetings, uh, Massachusetts is an area that, um, you know, the economic downturn doesn't particularly penetrate. What, so when, you, when you're talking to people now, um, what are people looking for as far as if you are in the market to buy, what are people looking for? It all depends. Your first time home buyers are looking for a star home and the folks in the starter homes are looking to move up. There's a cycle there that's always been. Uh, and then you've got folks that have been in their house for 20 years that are looking to either downsize or moving, you know, moving into assisted living homes. Um, you know, we do see a lot of people now looking for, I mean, if you wanna get in the technical design area, uh, we're looking, a lot of people looking for open space concept. Uh, they're looking for a larger square footage than they used to. Uh, there's a lot of demand for that right now, which is a little tougher in the city of New Bedford. What is the type of person that's looking right now? Is it the first time home buyers or is it the uh, family looking to expand or what have you? I think it's a combination. Uh, I think that your first time home buyers, uh, um, you see more of them than you ever have. Uh, millennial, the, the millennial group is now the largest group of consumers uh, overtaking the baby boomers. So there are a lot of people out there looking. And for people who don't know, explain, what is the millennial people? So, uh, so millennial people are between 80 and 1980 and 1995 in that area. So, you know, they're anywhere between 25 and 35, 40. And the baby boomers, for again, for people who don't That's know. over 65 at this okay. point. Right. right. So, but the other thing, too, you were saying, which is interesting, and I always remember, too, as a, as a kid, is uh, a lot of, you know, like my grandparents were in the same house that they were in when I was a kid. They, they never moved. Once they got a house, they got a house. Right. Right. Is that still the case, you think? No, I see a lot of, I mean, 
I want to say, I, I don't know the exact uh, st statistic, but I want to say it's every seven years on average people move now, whether it be because really? of a job or because they want to move up or something's going on. Uh, that was the last statistic I heard. It might have been a I, year. Is, that, down, is that less than it was, I don't know, years ago? I'm not sure. I don't know what it was years ago. Like you said, you know, I mean, I my parents too. My parents bought you know, a house and bought one more house and that's what they've lived in for their entire life. So it's, you know, I think more people are moving around now because of jobs. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, folks are freer to, to do those types of things. It's funny because I, I mean, you hear the stats that the average person I think moves every, f has moves five times in their life or something like that. I'm going, geez, my parents moved in to Wareham in 1978 and stayed there <laughs> forever. Forever. Same house. Yeah. Um, yeah, my parents did that too. My grandparents, my grandmother, I don't even know when she moved in with my grandfather, but they, she stayed there and, you know, basically she died there. I mean, that was it. it. One house. Right. They didn't have as many houses back then either to choose from. So, is um, do you see a lot of building going on right now? Houses? There, there's some. We definitely, we're, we're, not, we're not able to keep up with the amount of uh, people that are looking anymore. Uh, it used to be that building used to outpace the market. Now the market is completely outpaced building. Uh, part of that's because of zoning restri restrictions. Part of that's because a lot of the surrounding communities now have larger uh, acreages that are required and, and, you know, different things like that. Even the city of New Bedford used to have a, uh, a, a larger footprint. You know, they, they, they don't allow for such building on smaller footprints anymore. So um, some of that will change now because of the governor's housing choice bill that was passed uh, so that'll make a difference I mean that allows communities within Massachusetts and this was something that the realtors actually advocated for uh, for a long time our local association our state association and I'm pleased to just get it passed last month it allows um, uh, zoning boards throughout the state <clears throat> to have a simple majority vote versus a super majority vote when it comes to changing zoning ordinances for building as well as other things. You were telling me off camera, which I thought was interesting, the stat was fascinating about the price of a house in New Bedford. I mean, you talked about what it was in January of 2020 before the pandemic, and every logic indicates because of a pandemic, things won't go up like they have. Yeah, it's a seller's market. You know, um, we started off the year at $244,000 for the average sale in New Bedford, and as of December, it was $300,000. On the, on the average sale. And that is because um, there's just not enough listings out there. It, and I assume it's like that throughout the region. Um, it is. Not just New Bedford, but you're talking. It is, it's all over Southeast of Massachusetts. I mean, quite frankly, it's all over Massachusetts. The Massachusetts stats are very similar to the New Bedford stats. And that is, um, you know, your average days on market is under 30 days. I mean, I haven't seen that in years and years. Your um, amount of listings, I haven't seen, I've never seen that. I started in the business back in 1997. I've never seen that. And I've talked to folks that have been in the business even longer than that. I've never seen that little amount of inventory. I would imagine that there are a lot of deals that haven't gone through in a sense um, because the people who are selling are probably looking for a house too. And I would assume that's contingent, you know, when you're selling a house, it's contingent on being able to buy, buy something. Yeah, um, and that gets tricky. That gets very tricky. Um, and so obviously you know, there are a lot of different reasons why people accept an offer. Sales price is just one of them. Like you said, there are contingencies, whether it be um, you know, how well they can finance their mortgage, how much they're gonna put down, but one of them is you know, finding another house. And those have become very, very difficult. Um, so oftentimes you'll find someone that will accept an offer contingent and sometimes it just falls through and ends up back on the market again. But again, in this market, there are a lot of buyers out there. So, you know, uh, realtors will have backup offers ready to go just in case. The, as we talk about prices, the interesting thing that I've seen, and I know only because in our little cul-de-sac neighborhood, we saw it with a house. I mm -hmm. mean, uh, one of my neighbors bought a house unseen, other than online. Right. Um, got in a bidding war. Um, again, just online. Is that something, I don't want to say normal, but is that something you've seen a lot of during this time? I've heard I've heard some antidotes of that. Um, I don't, can, I don't I wouldn't consider it normal at this point, but it has happened and it continues to happen. Whether it be 
they see it online or, you know, or someone's doing a Zoom walkthrough uh, for a particular client because they're not in the area. Um, you know, we're still in COVID times. There are some folks that are nervous whether they don't want to walk into someone's house because they don't know what their health situation is or the, the, the seller themselves don't want buyers in. So there's some of that electronic going on. Um, and there are some people that buy, there's some people that buy subject to home inspection that have never seen the property at all. So that's, to me, that seems crazy, but. It does happen. And you were talking about, uh, you know, off camera, something interesting about contingency too, because when you talk about getting into a, uh, uh, sort of a price war, if you will, for the house, people will put in for contingencies, uh, okay, you know, I'll buy it for this, but I'll go up uh, higher. Escalation clauses. Right. So there are two different kinds of bidding war. You've had the one that you keep going back to your buyer and saying, hey, you know, this is uh, the best price or you, you got to give you a best and final. And then there are some folks that build in escalation clauses into their offer, which means basically, you know, hey, the house is listed at 299. Uh, I want to pay 299 for it, but I am willing to go up to 318, depending on what happens with other with other bidders. That escalation clause can be a little tricky, though, because now your information is out there, uh, you know, so it makes it a little bit more difficult not to hit that 318 at right. some point. You know? right. But again, it all it's not just sales price. Sales price has a lot to do with it, but sellers do determine other factors sometimes when it comes to the sale. Uh, you know, one of the big things obviously you've ever heard with the real estate is location, location, location. Right. What are, is there a particular area that people gravitate to right now? Um, I mean, being in the city versus being in rural. I mean, it sounds like New Bedford's doing well as far as selling houses. They are. Um, but it seems like every, every place is doing well. So is there any rhyme or reason right now as to what's, for lack of a better, more popular than someplace else? You know, uh, some of it comes down to um, families that want to be in specific school areas. And it's not one specific school area. It's you know, some people are comfortable. Some people have grown up in Fairhaven and that's where they want their kids to go to school. Some people have grown up in the North End of New Bedford and that's where they want their kids to go to school. Uh, some people just hear great things about certain school districts. Uh, so I would say, you know, when it comes to families, that school district is what drives a lot of families to whatever they decide. And I don't, there's no one particular area. Like you said, you know, it's not just New Bedford, Fairhaven, Acushnet, Dartmouth, uh, they're all they're all doing pretty well, and they all have listing issues too. Uh, you talk about these COVID times, right. um, and I'm curious as to what you've seen, and you've talked a little bit about it on an, you know as in our conversation. What has technology? What has changed the way real estate is done right now because of the pandemic? So you talked about online. We talked about a little bit of Zoom, right? Whether it be an online uh, showing of the property Correct, or yeah. being on a Zoom call with the agent and the, uh, you know, the, the seller or the buyer or whatever the case may be. Uh, the closing has changed significantly. Uh, most times the agent is no longer in the closing room with the uh, the buyer or the seller. A lot of times the buyer and seller are in the same room. Right. The seller will go in, sign all the documents. They'll, they'll go out to the waiting room. The buyer will go in, sign all the documents. Uh, so that has dramatically changed. Um, electronic, uh, electronic forms have become huge. We've had electronic forms in this area for a few years now, but uh, they've become even more prevalent since COVID. That and um, electronic notarization, which started maybe back last April or May, because of the pandemic, mm -hmm. uh, the governor uh, signed a, a, a bill allowing for electronic um, notarization, which was a huge thing, because just trying to get something notarized during the, the, during the pandemic was very difficult. Do you see some of the changes sticking after the pandemic? Absolutely. Yeah, I mean, you know, it's just so much easier for people to be able to throw these forms back and forth electronically. It's all password protected now, it's all encrypted. Uh, that, and like I said, the notarizations, I think will have some, some stay. Um, there may even be some, you know, we had virtual tours before, they just weren't necessarily the only thing you use to sell the house. You'll continue with that, there'll be virtual tours. Uh, there'll be some Zoom meetings uh, with folks, but I think, you know, this is still a 
face-to-face, -face, people to people And I business. was going to ask you that because we've had other people come in and talk to us and, and sure the technology's great, but the one-on-one -on -one relationships, discussions in many businesses or industries are huge. And I would assume yours is huge, if not the most important thing. Right, yeah, most of my members say that. They say, you know, we miss the face-to-face -face and uh, we, we can't wait to get back to that. And there are a lot of consumers that are, are the same way, you know. We're talking with Paul Chase. He is the CEO of the Realtors Association of Southeastern Massachusetts. Um, curious too, with regards to commercial properties, and I was talking to you off uh, air uh, before uh, about, you know, you look at Boston and, and they're talking about, they're worried about the space now that has gone vacant since the pandemic started and it may stay vacant, uh, but commercial properties still seem here. Uh, you see new businesses starting and what have you that, that still seems to be uh, a good aspect of the industry. It is. I mean, there is still, uh, you know, before COVID commercial property was, st it was still lagging behind residential uh, and, it, and it continues to do so. I think the, the, the hotter hit areas of the cities like Boston who have just put up mammoth commercial buildings at times. And I think what we're gonna see, what we're gonna find is some of that's probably gonna turn into housing, affordable housing, uh, because like you said, I just don't, you know, they're gonna, there's gonna be a certain percentage, whether it be 10, 15%, uh, that just won't end up back in the office. And there'll be some commercial businesses, some of the larger ones that will uh, maintain benefits for people. The new benefit will be, well, you can work from home, you know, they might be able to pay them a little bit less because they don't have to travel. So, you know, that'll work out for the companies. Local areas in, in you know, New Bedford, we'll see a little bit of that, but you know, it's, not, it's not as much as like the densely populated metro cities. Do you see, um, you know, when you talk about prices and what have you, do you, over the course of the year, you, you talked about the stat earlier, but do you see that trend continuing here in 2021? The trend of? Fi just the prices of the, whether it be up. commercial or housing going right, up. Right. Yeah. Uh, so, I believe that, you know, looking at all the, the numbers that I do in statistics and over the past year, um, I would say that right now we're in a little bit of an artificial infl inflation period. Uh, and that is because pre-COVID we had a listing problem. We've, we've had a listing problem for a long time. Uh, we just haven't had enough um, properties for sale. Uh, but COVID hit and then there were people that were nervous about putting their property on the market. They still are. so. That actually artificially increased uh, the less amount of inventory and increased the demand for you know higher home sales. I do think that'll level off a little bit after you know, I'm, who knows maybe the summertime or so. Right. Um, I do think that'll level off a little bit, but I don't think it's going to stop from the prices going up. They're just not going to go up as much, uh, and I think that's again because of uh, there's. There's a lot of fascinating things happening over the last couple of years, and that's got to do with uh, baby boomers who don't leave their house anymore. Um, a lot of baby boomers you're seeing, you know, with home health care aides in their house, they're living longer, they're staying in their homes longer, which then doesn't allow that middle ground to move up. Remember right. I said there's a little bit of a cycle. Right. Um, and that, if that group doesn't move up, then your first time home buyers don't move into that middle ground. So there's some of that. And the fact that millennials now uh, make up a large majority of the population and they're looking more than ever, um, there's just gonna, there's going to continue to be an inventory problem until cities and towns uh, come to the realization that we need to make uh, smaller footprints for houses so we can make, you know, create more houses. And in urban areas have more multifamily and more out of the box thinking for you know, whether it be micro condos or things of that nature. What should people be looking for right now as they're looking for property or what have you in COVID? What should they be looking for? What tips do you give them right now? Because again, if they, if they can't, if they can only go online or what have you, right. how do you help them make a good choice for a house, wherever it is? Right, so the first thing the buyer really needs to do in this market, and we've said this for a long time, but particularly in this case, you have to get pre-approved for a mortgage. Nobody's even gonna be, nobody's gonna take you seriously if you're not pre-approved. Uh, so that's the first thing you have to do. You really need to, you know, go to a bank, go to a credit union, go to a mortgage company, whatever it is, sit down with someone and talk to them. 
you know, they're going to pull your credit score. They're going to look to see what you have for available funds. And they're going to say, okay, this is where you can be. Um, keep in mind that sometimes what they put you for a mortgage is not necessarily what you should be purchasing a house <laughs> yeah. for either, right? I mean, we saw that years ago, and unfortunately, that, that hurt a lot of people. So you have to be careful with that. But that's the absolute first thing you have to do. You have to, you have to get your finances together, uh, and then you have to be prepared to buy. You can't, it's not like the old days where you could find seven, eight, ten different listings and go, well, I'll think about it because it's not there next week. So you have to be, you have to have a good pl fiscal plan, uh, pre-approved, always find a buyer's agent. Um, and I stress this a lot. Um, and what, if for people that don't know, what is that? A buyer's agent is someone that's going to represent you. So you're going to get into a contract with them, similar to what a seller's agent does okay, right. for a listing. Uh, and that buyer's agent should be representing you. Now, that doesn't mean that that buyer's agent is going, not going to help you figure something out with the house or, or say, you know, that's, that's not that big of a deal. You can overlook that. Because again, that's all part of what a buyer agent does. You know, they're trying to work for your best interests, whatever your interests are. And whatever your interests you share with them are, they should not be sharing with the selling agent or a listing agent because they have a fiduciary responsibility to you. So financial, first, you know, get your, get your, um, your pre-approval, work with a buyer's agent, and be prepared to put down that offer when you're ready. Just the opposite now, you want to sell your house, what should you be doing right now? I don't know, you got to get, you know, you want to look good, but what are the things right now that are critical in selling the house? So, uh, you don't need to go through construction. You need to declutter. Most people, you know, most people that declutter and neutralize their house uh, get a better selling price. Um, I think that is one of the major things that you can do. Uh, when it comes to looking for a listing agent, again, a lot of it's got to do with face-to-face -face people, contact. You may have worked with someone before and if you're very comfortable with them, great. If not, if, you're, if you don't have a listing agent, I would suggest um, interviewing three. At least three. Really? Yep. Just like a job interview. You want to interview them. You want to ask them what their uh, what their brokerage offers for um, advertising, uh, what their policy is for open house showings, what kind of plan that they have. You know, how will they continuously keep in contact with you? Um, you know, everything. Uh, you ask all kinds of questions and you interview, and uh, then you you feel more comfortable about the person that you're going to hire. Got a couple minutes left, but I want to talk about the rental uh, situation right sure. now in the city and, and around. I mean, we've talked about buying, but the rental properties seem to be just as difficult right now to find a, a decent apartment. I don't know what a decent apartment costs right now, but those seem to be going up as well. Right. I mean, I'm seeing anywhere from a thousand to fifteen hundred dollars for a two two bedroom, three bedroom, a two bedroom on the thousand side, but. Um, yeah, the multifamily market was uh, getting uh, very busy before COVID. Um, there is some artificial inflation there as well because of the rail, uh, where we are seeing investors coming down, or we're seeing investors within the city that are deciding that they want to purchase. Um, so we are seeing some of that. So with the you know multifamily sales going up a little bit, we're seeing some of the rents go up, and again. That is why it's so critical for us to build affordable housing. And it I was going to say, can you can you price yourself out if you are a multifamily home owner? Mm -hmm. Can you price yourself out of the market? And I would, especially in southeastern Mass, where the income is not like it is in Boston. Right. You have to be very careful. Yes. And I think some of the ways to get around that, and this isn't just the typical buyer, uh, but the investor, the way they get around that is they pay cash. So they don't have the, uh, the, the, uh, the interest rate that they have to pay on it. So that helps to bring down you know, their cash flow a little bit more. But yeah, multifamily is getting to the point where it used to be you bought a multifamily and it was a three family home and you rent to three people, you make a little extra money, you pay off the house and such and such. And that's getting to be you know, very difficult to do with uh, the, the prices that these multifamilies are starting to go for. Well, the other thing that I've heard too, and again, I, I've never rented property, but I've heard people that would rent for, quote, lower than what you might get, but they get a stable tenant 
so that they know that person's going to yep. be there. And I don't know which is the right way, but you hear people that have had the same tenant for 15 years, right? And they've yeah, the rent's gone up, but it's lower than I guess other people charge, right? So again, that is a personal preference. I mean, I I would say that if you have a tenant that is uh, is a good solid tenant that pays every month uh, in you know no problems no problems to me that's worth your weight in gold right you still have to pay the mortgage and that's what I've heard yeah right you still have to pay the mortgage a lot of times you'll find that in the smaller two and three families if it's an owner occupied a lot of times an owner occupied will buy it with the thought of renting out just to help pay their mortgage but it's not an investment property and if they get someone that's in there for 10 or 15 years that they love they'll stick with that person because they'll pay a little bit more in their mortgage themselves than you know go up on the rent uh, but your investor properties it's more about the cash flow and again the concern like you were talking about it too is that you could price yourself out of the market and you then could. then what do you do right then you're stuck with you know multifamily that you're just not making enough on or you're just making ends meet and that's always a dangerous situation for for any multifamily or owner. you've got people in new bedford or i'm going to just pick on new bedford sure but you've got people around here who can't afford to go into a house they can't buy and then now they can't rent right right and again um you know that's why we need more affordable housing and not just in the city of new bedford there no it there needs to be a collective effort uh around the area you know all of these towns uh need to have more affordable housing and you know, there needs to be more condo units, more affordable housing, micro apartments are, are very handy. We're seeing a lot of that. Um, there's one interesting, and I'm trying to remember where, I can't remember where it is, but there's a development right now that's going on, one of the first of its kind in the country. And uh, it's a development of in-law apartment houses. It's a whole housing development with in-law apartments built in. The grandparents are now moving to the in-law apartment giving the families a little bit of money to buy the house and and to be able to afford it and there's this whole grandparents community out there like there's 30 there's 30 houses in this development they're all grandparents they're all like-minded they're, they're helping to watch the kids at times and you know all these different types of creations are going to help down the road but we've got to be creative with housing for people who have questions or uh, want to get in touch with you, what uh, sure. is the best way to get in touch with you? So I'm always at the office in New Bedford. Uh, the number there is 508-993-0406. Uh, you can reach me at paul at r-a-s-e-m dot realtor. That's rasm dot realtor. And uh, I'm in that office. Sometimes I'm bouncing into the, uh, the Taunton building. We do a lot of digital media production for our members and education and things like that. But yeah, you can reach me there. It's good seeing you. Yeah, you too. Thanks good for coming you. in. We went by fast. We did. Uh, we'll bring you in a bit. Uh, it's good talk and good information too. Sure, absolutely. That's going to do it for this edition of our conversation with. I'm Jim Marshall, the New Bedford Cable Network. Thanks for watching, and we'll talk to you again soon.